international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds quasi part one by alfred de musset one at the beginning of the reign of louis the fifteenth a young man named croisille son of a goldsmith was returning from paris to havre his native town he had been entrusted by his father with the transaction of some business and his trip to the great city having turned out satisfactorily the joy of bringing good news caused him to walk the sixty leagues more gaily and briskly than was his wont for though he had a rather large sum of money in his pocket he travelled on foot for pleasure he was a good-tempered fellow and not without wit but so very thoughtless and flighty that people looked upon him as being rather weak-minded his doublet buttoned awry his periwig flying to the wind his hat under his arm he followed the banks of the seine at times finding enjoyment in his own thoughts and again indulging in snatches of song up at daybreak supping at wayside inns and always charmed with this stroll of his through one of the most beautiful regions of france plundering the apple-trees of normandy on his way he puzzled his brain to find rhymes for all these rattle-pates are more or less poets and tried hard to turn out a madrigal for a certain fair damsel of his native place she was no less than a daughter of a fermier general mademoiselle godeau the pearl of havre a rich heiress and much courted croisille was not received at monsieur godeau's otherwise than in a casual sort of way that is to say he had sometimes himself taken there articles of jewellery purchased at his father's monsieur godeau whose somewhat vulgar surname ill-fitted his immense fortune avenged himself by his arrogance for the stigma of his birth and showed himself on all occasions enormously and pitilessly rich he certainly was not the man to allow the son of a goldsmith to enter his drawing-room but as mademoiselle godeau had the most beautiful eyes in the world and croisille was not ill-favoured and as nothing can prevent a fine fellow from falling in love with a pretty girl croisille adored mademoiselle godeau who did not seem vexed thereat thus was he thinking of her as he turned his steps toward havre and as he had never reflected seriously upon anything instead of thinking of the invincible obstacles which separated him from his lady-love he busied himself only with finding a rhyme for the christian name she bore mademoiselle godeau was called julie and the rhyme was found easily enough so croisy having reached enfler embarked with a satisfied heart his money and his madrigal in his pocket and as soon as he jumped ashore ran to the paternal house he found the shop closed and knocked again and again not without astonishment and apprehension for it was not a holiday but nobody came he called his father but in vain he went to a neighbor's to ask what had happened instead of replying the neighbor turned away as though not wishing to recognize him croisy repeated his questions he learned that his father his affairs having long been in an embarrassed condition had just become bankrupt and had fled to america abandoning to his creditors all that he possessed not realizing as yet the extent of his misfortune croisy felt overwhelmed by the thought that he might never again see his father it seemed to him incredible that he should be thus suddenly abandoned he tried to force an entrance into the store but was given to understand that the official seals had been affixed so he sat down on a stone and giving way to his grief began to weep piteously deaf to the consolations of those around him never ceasing to call his father's name though he knew him to be already far away at last he rose ashamed at seeing a crowd about him and in the most profound despair turned his steps towards the harbour 
on reaching the pier he walked straight before him like a man in a trance who knows neither where he is going nor what is to become of him he saw himself irretrievably lost possessing no longer a shelter no means of rescue and of course no longer any friends alone wandering on the seashore he felt tempted to drown himself then and there just at the moment when yielding to this thought he was advancing to the edge of a high cliff an old servant named jean who had served his family for a number of years arrived on the scene ah my poor jean he exclaimed you know all that has happened since i went away is it possible that my father could leave us without warning without farewell he is gone answered jean but indeed not without saying good-bye to you at the same time he drew from his pocket a letter which he gave to his young master quasi recognized the handwriting of his father and before opening the letter kissed it rapturously but it contained only a few words instead of feeling his trouble softened it seemed to the young man still harder to bear honorable until then and known as such the old gentleman ruined by an unforeseen disaster the bankruptcy of a partner had left for his son nothing but a few commonplace words of consolation and no hope except perhaps that vague hope without aim or reason which constitutes it is said the last possession one loses jean my friend you carried me in your arms said croisi when he had read the letter and you certainly are to-day the only being who loves me at all it is a very sweet thing to me but a very sad one for you for as sure as my father embarked there i will throw myself into the same sea which is bearing him away not before you nor at once but some day i will do it for i am lost what can you do replied jean not seeming to have understood but holding fast to the skirt of croisi's coat what can you do my dear master your father was deceived he was expecting money which did not come and it was no small amount either could he stay here i have seen him sir as he made his fortune during the thirty years that i served him i have seen him working attending to his business the crown pieces coming in one by one he was an honorable man and skilful they took a cruel advantage of him within the last few days i was still there and as fast as the crowns came in i saw them go out of the shop again your father paid all he could for a whole day and when his desk was empty he could not help telling me pointing to a drawer where but six francs remained there were a hundred thousand francs there this morning that does not look like a rascally failure sir there is nothing in it that can dishonor you i have no more doubt of my father's integrity answered croisi than i have of his misfortune neither do i doubt his affection but i wish i could have kissed him for what is to become of me i am not accustomed to poverty i have not the necessary cleverness to build up my fortune and if i had it my father is gone it took him thirty years how long would it take me to repair this disaster much longer and will he be living then certainly not he will die over there and i cannot even go and find him i can join him only by dying utterly distressed as croisi was he possessed much religious feeling although his despondency made him wish for death he hesitated to take his life at the first words of this interview he had taken hold of old jean's arm and thus both returned to the town when they had entered the streets and the sea was no longer so near it seems to me sir said jean that a good man has a right to live and that a misfortune proves nothing since your father has not killed himself thank god how can you think of dying since there is no dishonor in his case and all the town knows it is so what would they think of you that you felt unable to endure poverty it would be neither brave nor christian for at the very worst what is there to frighten you there are plenty of people born poor and who have never had either mother or father to help them on 
i know that we are not all alike but after all nothing is impossible to god what would you do in such a case your father was not born rich far from it meaning no offence and that is perhaps what consoles him now if you had been here this last month it would have given you courage yes sir a man may be ruined nobody is secure from bankruptcy but your father i make bold to say has borne himself through it all like a man though he did leave us so hastily but what could he do it is not every day that a vessel starts for america i accompanied him to the wharf and if you had seen how sad he was how he charged me to take care of you to send him news from you sir it is a right poor idea you have that throwing the helve after the hatchet every one has his time of trial in this world and i was a soldier before i was a servant i suffered severely at the time but i was young i was of your age sir and it seemed to me that providence could not have spoken his last word to a young man of twenty-five why do you wish to prevent the kind god from repairing the evil that has befallen you give him time and all will come right if i might advise you i would say just wait two or three years and i will answer for it you will come out all right it is always easy to go out of this world why will you seize an unlucky moment while jean was thus exerting himself to persuade his master the latter walked in silence and as those who suffer often do was looking this way and that as though seeking for something which might bind him to life as chance would have it at this juncture mademoiselle godot the daughter of the fermier general happened to pass with her governess the mansion in which she lived was not far distant quasi saw her enter it this meeting produced on him more effect than all the reasonings in the world i have said that he was rather erratic and nearly always yielded to the first impulse without hesitating an instant and without explanation he suddenly left the arm of his old servant and crossing the street knocked at monsieur godot's door two when we try to picture to ourselves nowadays what was called a financier in times gone by we invariably imagine enormous corpulence short legs a gigantic wig and a broad face with a triple chin and it is not without reason that we have become accustomed to form such a picture of such a personage every one knows to what great abuses the royal tax farming led and it seems as though there were a law of nature which renders fatter than the rest of mankind those who fatten not only upon their own laziness but also upon the work of others m godot among financiers was one of the most classical to be found that is to say one of the fattest at the present time he had the gout which was nearly as fashionable in his day as the nervous headache is in ours stretched upon a lounge his eyes half closed he was coddling himself in the coziest corner of a dainty boudoir the panel mirrors which surrounded him majestically duplicated on every side his enormous person bags filled with gold covered the table around him the furniture the wainscot the doors the locks the mantelpiece the ceiling were gilded so was his coat i do not know but that his brain was gilded too he was calculating the issue of a little business affair which could not fail to bring him a few thousand louis and was even deigning to smile over it to himself when quasi was announced the young man entered with a humble but resolute air and with every outward manifestation of that inward tumult with which we find no difficulty in crediting a man who is longing to drown himself m godot was a little surprised at this unexpected visit then he thought his daughter had been buying some trifle and was confirmed in that thought by seeing her appear almost at the same time with the young man he made a sign to quasi not to sit down but to speak 
the young lady seated herself on a sofa and croisier remaining standing expressed himself in these terms sir my father has failed the bankruptcy of a partner has forced him to suspend his payments and unable to witness his own shame he has fled to america after having paid his last sou to his creditors i was absent when all this happened i have just come back and have known of these events only two hours i am absolutely without resources and determined to die it is very probable that on leaving your house i shall throw myself into the water in all probability i would already have done so if i had not chanced to meet at the very moment this young lady your daughter i love her from the very depths of my heart for two years i have been in love with her and my silence until now proves better than anything else the respect i feel for her but to-day in declaring my passion to you i fulfil an imperative duty and i would think i was offending god if before giving myself over to death i did not come to ask you mademoiselle julie in marriage i have not the slightest hope that you will grant this request but i have to make it nevertheless for i am a good christian sir and when a good christian sees himself come to such a point of misery that he can no longer suffer life he must at least to extenuate his crime exhaust all the chances which remain to him before taking the final and fatal step at the beginning of this speech m godeau had supposed that the young man came to borrow money and so he prudently threw his handkerchief over the bags that were lying around him preparing in advance a refusal and a polite one for he always felt some good will toward the father of quasi but when he had heard the young man to the end and understood the purport of his visit he never doubted one moment that the poor fellow had gone completely mad he was at first tempted to ring the bell and have him put out but noticing his firm demeanour his determined look the fermier general took pity on so inoffensive a case of insanity he merely told his daughter to retire so that she might be no longer exposed to hearing such improprieties while quasi was speaking mademoiselle godeau had blushed as a peach in the month of august at her father's bidding she retired the young man making her a profound bow which she did not seem to notice left alone with quasi m godeau coughed rose then dropped again upon the cushions and trying to assume a paternal air delivered himself to the following effect my boy said he i am willing to believe that you are not poking fun at me but you have really lost your head i not only excuse this proceeding but i consent not to punish you for it i am sorry that your poor devil of a father has become bankrupt and has skipped it is indeed very sad and i quite understand that such a misfortune should affect your brain besides i wish to do something for you so take this stool and sit down there it is useless sir answered quasi if you refuse me as i see you do i have nothing left but to take my leave i wish you every good fortune and where are you going to write to my father and say good-bye to him eh the devil anyone would swear you were speaking the truth i'll be damned if i don't think you are going to drown yourself yes sir at least i think so if my courage does not forsake me that's a bright idea fie on you how can you be such a fool sit down sir i tell you and listen to me m godeau had just made a very wise reflection which was that it is never agreeable to have it said that a man whoever he may be threw himself into the water on leaving your house he therefore coughed once more took his snuff-box cast a careless glance upon his shirt frill and continued it is evident that you are nothing but a simpleton a fool a regular baby you do not know what you are saying you are ruined that's what has happened to you but my dear friend all that is not enough one must reflect upon the things of this world if you came to ask me well good advice for instance i might give it to you but what is it you are after you are in love with my daughter 
yes sir and i repeat to you that i am far from supposing that you can give her to me in marriage but as there is nothing in the world but that which could prevent me from dying if you believe in god as i do not doubt you do you will understand the reason that brings me here whether i believe in god or not is no business of yours i do not intend to be questioned answer me first where have you seen my daughter in my father's shop and in this house when i brought jewellery for mademoiselle julie who told you her name was julie what are we coming to great heavens but be her name julie or javat do you know what is wanted in any one who aspires to the hand of the daughter of a fermier general no i am completely ignorant of it unless it is to be as rich as she something more is necessary my boy you must have a name well my name is quasi your name is quasi poor wretch do you call that a name upon my soul and conscience sir it seems to me to be as good a name as godot you are very impertinent sir and you shall rue it indeed sir do not be angry i had not the least idea of offending you if you see in what i said anything to wound you and wish to punish me for it there is no need to get angry have i not told you that on leaving here i am going straight to drown myself although m godeau had promised himself to send quasi away as gently as possible in order to avoid all scandal his prudence could not resist the vexation of his wounded pride the interview to which he had to resign himself was monstrous enough in itself it may be imagined then what he felt at hearing himself spoken to in such terms listen he said almost beside himself and determined to close the matter at any cost you are not such a fool that you cannot understand a word of common sense are you rich no are you noble still less so what is this frenzy that brings you here you come to worry me you think you are doing something clever you know perfectly well that it is useless you wish to make me responsible for your death have you any right to complain of me do i owe a son to your father is it my fault that you have come to this mon dieu when a man is going to drown himself he keeps quiet about it that is what i am going to do now i am your very humble servant one moment it shall not be said that you had recourse to me in vain there my boy here are three louis d'or go and have dinner in the kitchen and let me hear no more about you much obliged i am not hungry and i have no use for your money so quasi left the room and the financier having set his conscience at rest by the offer he had just made settled himself more comfortably in his chair and resumed his meditations mademoiselle godeau during this time was not so far away as one might suppose she had it is true withdrawn in obedience to her father but instead of going to her room she had remained listening behind the door if the extravagance of quasi seemed incredible to her still she found nothing to offend her in it for love since the world has existed has never passed as an insult on the other hand as it was not possible to doubt the despair of the young man mademoiselle godeau found herself a victim at one and the same time to the two sentiments most dangerous to women compassion and curiosity when she saw the interview at an end and quasi ready to come out she rapidly crossed the drawing-room where she stood not wishing to be surprised eavesdropping and hurried towards her apartment but she almost immediately retraced her steps the idea that perhaps quasi was really going to put an end to his life troubled her in spite of herself scarcely aware of what she was doing she walked to meet him the drawing-room was large and the two young people came slowly towards each other quasi was as pale as death and mademoiselle godeau vainly sought words to express her feelings in passing beside him she let fall on the floor a bunch of violets which she held in her hand 
he at once bent down and picked up the bouquet in order to give it back to her but instead of taking it she passed on without uttering a word and entered her father's room quasi alone again put the flowers in his breast and left the house with a troubled heart not knowing what to think of his adventure three scarcely had he taken a few steps in the street when he saw his faithful friend jean running towards him with a joyful face what has happened he asked have you news to tell me yes replied jean i have to tell you that the seals have been officially broken and that you can enter your home all your father's debts being paid you remain the owner of the house it is true that all the money and all the jewels have been taken away but at least the house belongs to you and you have not lost everything i have been running about for an hour not knowing what had become of you and i hope my dear master that you will now be wise enough to take a reasonable course what course do you wish me to take sell this house sir it is all your fortune it will bring you about thirty thousand francs with that at any rate you will not die of hunger and what is to prevent you from buying a little stock in trade and starting business for yourself you would surely prosper we shall see about this answered quasi as he hurried to the street where his home was he was eager to see the paternal roof again but when he arrived there so sad a spectacle met his gaze that he had scarcely the courage to enter the shop was in utter disorder the rooms deserted his father's alcove empty everything presented to his eyes the wretchedness of utter ruin not a chair remained all the drawers had been ransacked the till broken open the chest taken away nothing had escaped the greedy search of creditors and lawyers who after having pillaged the house had gone leaving the doors open as though to testify to all passers-by how neatly their work was done this then exclaimed quasi is all that remains after thirty years of work and a respectable life and all through the failure to have ready on a given day money enough to honor a signature imprudently given while the young man walked up and down given over to the saddest thoughts jean seemed very much embarrassed he supposed that his master was without ready money and that he might perhaps not even have dined he was therefore trying to think of some way to question him on the subject and to offer him in case of need some part of his savings after having tortured his mind for a quarter of an hour to try and hit upon some way of leading up to the subject he could find nothing better than to come up to quasi and ask him in a kindly voice sir do you still like roast partridges the poor man uttered this question in a tone at once so comical and so touching that quasi in spite of his sadness could not refrain from laughing and why do you ask me that said he my wife replied jean is cooking me some for dinner sir and if by chance you still like them quasi had completely forgotten till now the money which he was bringing back to his father jean's proposal reminded him that his pockets were full of gold i thank you with all my heart said he to the old man and i accept your dinner with pleasure but if you are anxious about my fortune be reassured i have more money than i need to have a good supper this evening which you in your turn will share with me saying this he laid upon the mantel four well-filled purses which he emptied each containing fifty louis although this sum does not belong to me he added i can use it for a day or two to whom must i go to have it forwarded to my father sir replied jean eagerly your father especially charged me to tell you that this money belongs to you and if i did not speak of it before it was because i did not know how your affairs in paris had turned out where he has gone your father will want for nothing he will lodge with one of your correspondents who will receive him most gladly he has moreover taken with him enough for his immediate needs for he was quite sure of still leaving behind more than was necessary to pay all his just debts all that he has left sir is yours 
he says so himself in his letter and i am especially charged to repeat it to you that gold is therefore legitimately your property as this house in which we are now i can repeat to you the very words your father said to me on embarking may my son forgive me for leaving him may he remember that i am still in the world only to love me and let him use what remains after my debts are paid as though it were his inheritance those sir are his own expressions so put this back in your pocket and since you accept my dinner pray let us go home the honest joy which shone in jean's eyes left no doubt in the mind of croisilles the words of his father had moved him to such a point that he could not restrain his tears on the other hand at such a moment four thousand francs were no bagatelle as to the house it was not an available resource for one could realize on it only by selling it and that was both difficult and slow all this however could not but make a considerable change in the situation the young man found himself in so he felt suddenly moved shaken in his dismal resolution and so to speak both sad and at the same time relieved of much of his distress after having closed the shutters of the shop he left the house with jean and as he once more crossed the town could not help thinking how small a thing our affections are since they sometimes serve to make us find an unforeseen joy in the faintest ray of hope it was with this thought that he sat down to dinner beside his old servant who did not fail during their repast to make every effort to cheer him heedless people have a happy fault they are easily cast down but they have not even the trouble to console themselves so changeable is their mind it would be a mistake to think them on that account insensible or selfish on the contrary they perhaps feel more keenly than others and are but too prone to blow their brains out in the moment of despair but this moment once passed if they are still alive they must dine they must eat they must drink as usual only to melt into tears again at bedtime joy and pain do not glide over them but pierce them through like arrows kind hot-headed natures which know how to suffer but not how to lie through which one can clearly read not fragile and empty like glass but solid and transparent like rock crystal after having clinked glasses with jean croisie instead of drowning himself went to the play standing at the back of the pit he drew from his bosom mademoiselle godot's bouquet and as he breathed the perfume in deep meditation he began to think in a calmer spirit about his adventure of the morning as soon as he had pondered over it for a while he saw clearly the truth that is to say that the young lady in leaving the bouquet in his hands and in refusing to take it back had wished to give him a mark of interest for otherwise this refusal and this silence could only have been marks of contempt and such a supposition was not possible croisi therefore judged that mademoiselle godot's heart was of a softer grain than her father's and he remembered distinctly that the young lady's face when she crossed the drawing-room had expressed an emotion the more true that it seemed involuntary but was this emotion one of love or only of sympathy or was it perhaps something of still less importance mere commonplace pity had mademoiselle godot feared to see him die him quasi or merely to be the cause of the death of a man no matter what man although withered and almost leafless the bouquet still retained so exquisite an odor and so brave a look that in breathing it and looking at it quasi could not help hoping it was a thin garland of roses round a bunch of violets what mysterious depths of sentiment an oriental might have read in these flowers by interpreting their language but after all he need not be an oriental in this case the flowers which fall from the breast of a pretty woman in europe as in the east are never mute 
were they but to tell what they have seen while reposing in that lovely bosom it would be enough for a lover and this in fact they do perfumes have more than one resemblance to love and there are even people who think love to be but a sort of perfume it is true the flowers which exhale it are the most beautiful in creation while croisilles mused thus paying very little attention to the tragedy that was being acted at the time mademoiselle godeau herself appeared in a box opposite the idea did not occur to the young man that if she should notice him she might think it very strange to find the would-be suicide there after what had transpired in the morning he on the contrary bent all his efforts towards getting nearer to her but he could not succeed a fifth-rate actress from paris had come to play merope and the crowd was so dense that one could not move for lack of anything better quasi had to content himself with fixing his gaze upon his lady-love not lifting his eyes from her for a moment he noticed that she seemed preoccupied and moody and that she spoke to every one with a sort of repugnance her box was surrounded as may be imagined by all the fops of the neighbourhood each of whom passed several times before her in the gallery totally unable to enter the box of which her father filled more than three-fourths quasi noticed further that she was not using her opera glasses nor was she listening to the play her elbows resting on the balustrade her chin in her hand with her far-away look she seemed in all her sumptuous apparel like some statue of venus disguised en marquise the display of her dress and her hair her rouge beneath which one could guess her paleness all the splendour of her toilet did but the more distinctly bring out the immobility of her countenance never had quasi seen her so beautiful having found means between the acts to escape from the crush he hurried off to look at her from the passage leading to her box and strange to say scarcely had he reached it when mademoiselle godeau who had not stirred for the last hour turned round she started slightly as she noticed him and only cast a glance at him then she resumed her former attitude whether that glance expressed surprise anxiety pleasure or love whether it meant what not dead or god be praised there you are living i do not pretend to explain be that as it may at that glance quasi inwardly swore to himself to die or gain her love end of quasi part one by alfred de musset